I'm Bogdan Vestal, we from Open Door. And actually, we want to talk about projects for this little node from open source tools. And we call it Honeycomb. And actually, that allows us to spin up clusters on demand, like Spark, Dust, indicative clusters. And to give you some context, we both work for Open Door. It's a company that's trying to flip houses, buy and sell them, and actually transfer supervised transactions, like remove middleman and actually make it fast so we can sell a house within the ASO. But to achieve this, we need to process tons of data, like terabytes of it. Uh, in just like all of the resources, like do ETL, train machine learning, in order to make a fair offer to the customer. And actually, a couple of words about us. I mean, Gustavo work on data and all platforms at Open Door. Most of do ETL, work with the feature store for data scientists. And uh, before we had experience of working in data systems, both Google and Airbnb. And if you're curious about Open Door, so there's like a couple of links. Block in the medium and I how regular block too. So today we're going to go through motivation, some context. What I also show you is our existing solutions for this problem space being faced. As I will go through architecture, operators, how do we auto scale, process and process our approach, <coughs> some learnings, and also do a small demo. So now to motivation. So essentially, to give you some context, this is our step. We our class runs the Docker Kubernetes. And we use Datadog for our blocks discovery. All ETL right now is on the Postgres, and partially is part of the desk. Uh, how many people do here at like Python? Python development? A couple, that's so many. And Dust is essentially extension is a parallel framework on top of Pandas, that allows you to do parallelization and do Python efficient applications too. And it's really handy, especially for data scientists, because it has the same interface as a Pandas does. And it's handy quite for Cycler, TensorFlow, and so on. We use a lot for a mouth. And then for ETL, we use Airflow and Luigi. I assume some of you know Airflow a bit. And for databases, Postgres, and surprise, be query. Not a decision, <coughs> but works well. Uh, how many of you know Kubernetes? That's good. I didn't use Python much. But yeah, short sure thing. You have a master, a master actually manages a fleet of containers. On each node, we have Docker and actually some agents like FluentD or Datadog agents to be able to collect different metrics. And then you have a set of pods, and pod is actually is an orchestration, is an organization of multiple containers that has some affinity. So, for instance, you can have a web server, and you also can have Nginx running together. And it helps you to scale and also creates like simplifies deploys, scale with those things, and handles it for you. And we're going to talk about Kubernetes a bit and actually part of our architecture. Uh, when we joined the company on the real estate, like, uh, we essentially initially evolved step by step, and actually every team, a number of times, had to do some data processing. As that needed to have be fast, as they had to do it on their own, so they actually they ended up kind of like tons of schedulers. So every team has their own scheduler, it could be Airflow or VG. As that caused different issues, like consistency. That's much one thing is processing data, and then also trying to dump it to S3. And you can actually make, make, you can make like, the middle of transaction. As it means essentially, you'll need some consistencies. And also, in Luigi, especially, <coughs> everybody uses it, like configuration is tied to a couple of the code, so for every deploy, you have to actually restart scheduling work. So you have to kill your process and develop it. And also, our clusters are statically allocated. And as you see in this reference, this is where our like, ML, ML, ML pipeline, this is our CPU usage. It's like we use the most half of it. Like, at night, we do some processing. In the daytime, it's business hours, people do some experimentations. And there's like five or six hours just purely idle. And the memory it's even worse, like only 5% is used. And we actually try wanted to tackle this problem. Uh, there are a couple of ways you can solve it without building anything. And there are a couple of pieces of this problem. One is just you're gonna have a full visibility, you can have like just single airport repository and a separate back repository. It's really crazy easy to set up. And it works well if you delete your compute from Apple worker to any cluster like Hive, Spark, whatever. I mean, like, actually, big companies do it a lot. Like, for instance, Airbnb, and it works well. However, like, for us, we have Python shop, and different teams need libraries. And actually, for every request of the library, you need to install it in the local <coughs> worker, and we do, like, essentially restart a whole cluster. And that's, like, it's disruptive. And also, at the same time, uh, one team will be bottleneck for you. Because other people are going to go to you and ask, can I still our library? Can I still, like, another utility that's all the browsers? That's not the best way. And I think also another thing we sometimes people tend to use Airflow for computational extensive like workflows to do some actual computing work. And also they are not designed well for um, balance 
process B is essentially there's a spike in one worker, you can actually kill another worker on actual class emissions. And another thing for compute, I mean, there are a couple of solutions that help you to scale automatically and dynamically. So, like EMR and Dataproc or Databricks, I believe. Uh, they're easy to set up and run and no need to maintain at all. But for us, well, there are a couple of limitations with it. This one didn't go with them, like not frequent Spark updates. And also, we do Python, so essentially, we still need dependencies like second learn and pandas on NumPy may take hours. And essentially, if you want to scale up and down, before you can actually scale up and start it, you have to wait for a whole hour before it's going to be finished. Another thing is that actually, once you have the Spark cluster up, you need to have all the permissions. And first, if you want to talk to database, you need to have a secret management. In Kubernetes, you get it for free, but there is no easy way for us to integrate this now. The same start with blogging. And a couple of words, so now we're going to talk about architecture, what we actually built to solve a problem for us. So the goal was for us to essentially build a company by doing the process system with low waiting costs and actually with low overall costs. We had several requirements. We had a couple of teams who wanted to build and have a dynamic spark clusters and dust clusters, and also want to give them a full freedom to use libraries they want. We want to use R, we use Go4 and just install and use it, build the Docker image and spin it up. I also want to do efficient cluster utilization. So if nobody is using the cluster, we want to take it down to start, so not pay for it. Because EC2 costs add up really well. And the last one, universal scheduling system. We want to have full visibility of all decks across multiple teams. And teams should be able to depend on each other. So this is our set of our goals. And actually, this project was fully inspired from Airbnb and Uber. Airbnb built an amazing project called Airflow that allows you to build upon those different abstractions like Operators, for instance. And then Bloomberg, what they did is they did a lot of work for the last year, they trying to make a move from Airflow to work directly with Kubernetes. <coughs> so what they want, so schedule can talk to other Kubernetes and deploy different workers automatically. Uh, unfortunately, it's still not merged, there's still no progress. And right now it's an extensive QA phase. Uh, but I mean, if you're curious, we can share slides later. There are a couple of links to read more about how they do work with operators and essentially. What's, what is the status of the work? And hopefully, we'll be able to download this in this year. So, and once we're finished, we plan to migrate to their solution. And our architecture is fairly simple. So, we have a couple of pieces components. It's Airflow, to the workers that abstract talking to communities to so essentially they hide all the YAML specifications we need to specify to be able to deploy the cluster. As well, Kubernetes set up, we're going to all the nodes. I and mean, Kubernetes also, in addition to that, we have a class of autoscaler. So you can actually talk to Amazon autoscaling group and then bring up and down nodes once we need on demand. And here, actually, we start will continue with all the computation specifics and how operators are working. But, hello. Uh, and this double. So now I'm going to continue with what uh, Bogdan was talking. So some very important part of our infrastructure is the operators. Operators are basically what keeps uh, the glue that keeps everything together, that makes uh, the communication between Airflow and Kubernetes happen. So in order to do that, we have to define a set of operators that all of our users <coughs> will to use. So we started with what we call the OD from Open Door, pod operator. You basically need to define three things. You need to define a Docker image well, that has all your dependencies installed, that it's already built, that uh, can be specified here, with a second half of an image. You also need to specify the resources for your, for your job, right? You want to specify how much memory do you use, how many cores do you use, actually this is mini cores, so it's a thousand of a, of a CPU core. And lastly, you need to define also what command line to run, right? That's actually the job that you want to scale. So like in this case, we have any bash command that runs tasks, MLS Bible. So what this happens is like we get from a declarative point of view, we declare what we want to have, what we want to run, and like this operator will take charge and will basically do this, like dock around, run task, and it will be scheduled on our Kubernetes nodes. Uh, under the hood, what's really happening is like we have a for those of you that are familiar with Kubernetes, basically Kubernetes receives a YAML specification in which you define uh, how your resources are, what do you want to compute and what do you want to run on your, on your infrastructure. So this is like a, the template that we create, and we just uh, replace the, the image, the command line, even Unix environment, like if you want to add environment variables, 
and resources in it, and then we just send it to Kubernetes, so that Kubernetes will actually take, guard, uh, take charge and make sure that it's actually running. Uh, an interesting thing, in order to, to airflow to know whether your job succeeded or not, right, like we just send it to run, but we don't know whether that job actually ran correctly, we need to monitor constantly this pod or this container. Uh, we monitor the exit status of the pods, like every minute we are always listening to see if the pods is still running or if it's uh, or if they had exit. If it exits with an exit code of zero, we call that a success, as in any uh, Unix uh, utility. Anything that is not zero, we call it a failure. So whenever your program raises an exception or it exits uh, abruptly, it will be basically a non-success. Same as like uh, running out of memory, any kind of other issues. Another, uh, another important part for monitoring your pod, you also want to have visibility into what's going on, right? Like you don't want to run your job and know how, have no clue what actually happened in there. So we also use the Kubernetes API to basically fetch the logs from that pod, from your container, into the airflow worker. That way we can actually visualize through the airflow UI. For example, I want to know how my uh, job that ran yesterday, why did it fail? So I can just go to the logs and I can see everything that was wrong. Similarly, we also build on top of the uh, pod operator, we were able to build like more complex operators. Specifically, one of them is like a spike summit operator. This is basically a, uh, a subclass of the open door pod operator, but it actually brings a spark cluster the once you one it brings up. You have to specify the same things that you specify for your pod operator, but you need to specify a few more things. First, like a worker count, that means how many instances of your spark workers are gonna be run. Uh, uh, the worker resources, same like CPU, how much CPU do your workers use, and how much memory they use. Uh, the Spark program path, so you can actually specify what, uh, where does uh, your program path live. Uh, please note that this uh, program path has to live in that image that you have there. So like all your dependencies are already in the Docker image, so you don't have to actually ship, but like uh, create a zip file, and send it there, it should already exist in your image. Uh, also like Spark program arcs, any command line arguments that you want to pass to your Spark program. So here is the overall architecture of what works. We have this Kubernetes cluster. Note that the cluster can actually have spin many different EC2 instances or AWA or Google Cloud instances. We have the driver pod, which is like the, the same as from the audit pod operator. It's actually running there your actual code, the driver from Spark. Uh, we also bring like the Spark submit operator brings up your Spark scheduler and it brings us as many Spark workers as you want to. Uh, the way how the driver pod knows about Spark scheduler, we just set an environment variable with your Spark's uh, scheduler URL. So up to this point, we were able to run compute uh, like arbitrary programs and containers in our infrastructure, right? This will be all good and great if we will have like a static set of nodes, but we actually wanted to go one step further and let's say, okay, we just want to have resources when we need it and not uh, and at, and at any other point. So in order to do our scaling, we had to go and understand a little bit more of Kubernetes. First, we wanted to know how to bring, how to create reserve nodes, reserve EC2 nodes for our ETL. The reason for this is we don't want to run our ETL pipeline in the same machines that we run our HTTP servers, because suppose that we want to bring down one of those nodes, and there was like, a, in that same node, there was an HTTP request in flight, if we will kill that node, all those requests will be lost, which will be restricted for our users. So what we did is like uh, use a two uh, concepts introduced by Kubernetes. One is called a taint. A taint is basically a label that you apply to your Kubernetes nodes or AWS instances, in which you tell only pods that tolerate this taint are able to run on this node. Right? So in this case, these two nodes are premium because we added a taint that no everyone can run in there. The second concept on the other side of things, on the pod, is called toleration. You can tell a pod that it has, a, it's basically a label that tells that it can run or tolerate a specific taint. So you can have a, a specific pod that will actually tolerate your taint. Right, that way these pods can be scheduled on these special nodes. Note that if the pod has this uh, toleration, it can still be assigned to the regular, to a regular node. Another interesting thing, that, another thing that we actually needed 
is because things and tolerations are not the only thing that we need to make this happen. We also have the concept of affinity. So we want to, if we have a new container and we have three different uh, nodes, Kubernetes nodes, <coughs> we don't want to run on the common node because that's not actually reserved for our ETL jobs. So we created like a use node affinity from Kubernetes, which tells if there are several nodes where I can run, where should I be scaled? So we, we set affinity to always run on these reserved nodes. So then the container might be able to run in one, either this or this. The second kind of affinity, we call it pod affinity, mm -hmm. is like since we want to actually save, on that, save money and you be resource aware, in this case, even though we have space here, we prefer to be scaled here if there are enough resources so that we can actually scale down this and not, uh, not use it. So we say that all, the, all our ETL pods have affinity with each other. That way we can do bin packing in the same nodes and just use, uh, and use our computers uh, efficiently. So here's the overall architecture for how we do auto scaling. We created an AWS uh, auto scaling group, which is called uh, the Honeycomb Instance Group. We make sure that all those uh, nodes in an instance group have the same taint. We call it Honeycomb. Then we use a, like a, a binary that is actually maintained by the same Kubernetes uh, operators. It's called the Cluster Auto Scaler. We didn't touch that code at all. We just use it out of the box. Basically, what it does is that it uh, you connect it to like a AWS instance groups. It monitors your pods that cannot schedule due to resource, the lack of resources. And after waiting for say one minute or two, it decides okay, there's no more resources. So uh, it talks with the AWS API and spin up a new instance. Then uh, after one or two minutes, that pod gets scheduled on that new instance. It can run to completion. Once the pod uh, finishes, it says, oh, there's, uh, there's some nodes that are underutilized. We can actually go ahead and kill it. So here is uh, an actual graph of our, the number of nodes that we use for our ETL. You can see that it's very spiky. Usually that's a 12 UTC where everyone runs their daily jobs. So like this, uh, this graph shows that we are only using resources when we need it, as expected. Uh, another cool stuff that we can actually do, because we are running only ETL, we actually do not care about having reserved instances or like very high performance instances that we use for like, say like serving, uh, handling HTTP requests on real time. So we are able to actually use the spot instances. So the max price uh, specifies how much we're willing to pay for a specific instance and that, that actually does a bit on the AWS. Uh, this is about half the price that we pay for, like, the, for the instances that we pay for, for our HTTP servers. Now we'll discuss a little bit about the pros and cons of this approach. First, let's go with the, with the pros. We empower users via full stack freedom. Now they actually can run uh, any programming language that they want. They can use uh, any libraries that they want without having to depend on other teams having to decide on that. Uh, they can also use as, mu I mean, as much resources as they want because they're not running on the same hardware. They can actually, one can just use uh, two gigs of memory, while another big task can use uh, 20 gigs of memory, and that's okay. We also have low maintenance for infrastructure teams. We were the ones maintaining this, so we don't have to actually uh, worry about installing different libraries. We make sure that uh, Docker is the library, the interface that we have with other teams. And the nice thing, we don't have the, any dependency help. Uh, another thing, we have more visibility into company data processing. So we can actually depend, since we have all, all the same, uh, all the ETL on the same scheduler, we can depend on different teams. So team A can actually be the, make sure that it triggers its computation after team B is done. Uh, another interesting thing is cloud independence. All of this is basically cloud agnostic. Even the cloud cluster the scaler, it talks with AWS, but it also you can actually specify to talk with GCP without any issue. And the last thing, low cost. Basically, we are uh, efficiently utilizing all of our resources. We pay less for the resources that we use for ETL, and we basically can turn like each job can be turned differently, so they don't have to use a huge Spark cluster for something that can be used in one worker or two workers. Now the bad part, 
we actually require having a Kubernetes cluster. For us, it was, a, it was we already had a Kubernetes cluster, so that's why we went with this approach. Uh, so that did require some knowledge and potentially mitigating existing users to Kubernetes. Uh, another thing that's uh, not great so far is uh, a stateless Spark. So because we have this auto scaling, we bring up new clusters and then we bring it down. That means that we don't have a permanent store or HDFS <coughs> or even a hive metro store yet. We still can work on that, but like uh, we need to think better about it. We have an ephemeral Spark UI. So the, as soon as the cluster dies, the Spark UI dies. I think we can actually fix this by using like a Spark history server, but we haven't actually had the time to do it yet. Uh, another important thing is well, having now scaling brings some complexity into your Kubernetes setup. So if you bring 100 nodes, it might be okay, but once you start bringing 500 more nodes, you have to start thinking about the, the load you're actually exercising on your Kubernetes master. So, the main learning, the one thing that we wanted to remember from this, uh, from this talk is actually current big data open source tools, tools allow you to build a scalable data processing at a fairly low cost. Everything that we use is actually open source and the code that we wrote was only the operators, which was uh, a couple hundred lines of code. So here now we can actually go through a demo. So let's see. So here I have something running. So, for example, the, same, this is the only thing I run is like I run my own Sparks uh, executor mm -hmm. and it starts bringing a cluster. So let's see if we can actually cancel this. Yeah, actually, canceling is actually terminating the cluster, so this is actually uh, monitoring the, the Kubernetes API. Uh, if we run this, we can actually see how the will start appearing here. There should appear as well. Let's see. And again, maybe the one point. Ah, here they're coming. You see this one has like zero seconds container creating. So we're actually creating all of the all of the parts in demand. Here is actually downloading all the packages to install uh, uh, Jupyter. So if we can wait a couple of seconds, we actually see it. Here you can see like uh, all of these parts, like the one that like have 17 seconds, were the ones that we just scale up directly. This might have run in a node that we already have up, or if it might take, if there was no space, we will have brought a new one. And this wait thing. So yeah, thank you all for your attention. Now we're all open to questions. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so you say one of the cons is stateless Spark. Mm -hmm. um, you, you use Spark on S3 or? We use Spark on S3. And is that, well, why is that stateless? So the status part is like, for example, we don't have a HDFS set up or anything like that. We do have some state. We also haven't set up a hive meta store yet. It's in our plans. Mm -hmm. So you still have to like deal with, for example, you have to remember, like your jobs have to remember where in S3 everything was uh, stored. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think the most annoying so far is like not having the Spark UI persist. Okay. Because you cannot go back and throw jobs that failed yesterday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think using the history server will be able to fix that, but yeah. it requires some work. And your experience with Spark over S3 is good? It's fast enough? Or? So far, yes. I mean, we just, to be honest, we have just started using Spark just recently, but yeah, we are still learning. So far, it has been working well for us. Yes. Where do you persist your data? And what is your data volume? <coughs> so we persisted on, on S3. Uh, well, there's different parts. Like Some of the data is persisted in S3, and some of the, other, some of the data is actually in Postgres. We're actually migrating to a world where we we'll want to store everything on S3 because our uh, Postgres instance is not scaling up for all our writes. Your data volume? Our data volume. A couple terabytes. A couple terabytes, probably. Yeah. For yeah. what? Uh, for, for, I mean, for one job, essentially, we'll take a couple terabytes of data and we output a couple of terabytes of data. So I assume that your metadata is stored in Postgres, right? 
so so far, most uh, almost all of our data is stored in Postgres. We are starting to store some tables like in Parquet files you know, on S3, but we want to eventually move to have a meta store where we'll store all the metadata, but we are not there yet. So, so right now, your Postgres database, where, where is it? Yeah. AWS, it's an RDS instance. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So when you run your job, say a couple of terabytes worth of data, how long does it take? I think the biggest one that we run, I think it's addresses, it takes like, I think we just migrated. So before we were just doing like SQL, ETL, now we're starting to do it in uh, in Spark. It's taking like a couple of hours. Yeah. I mean, one hour to read from Postgres. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the time it's actually reading from Postgres. We read it and then we have to write it again. And it's still improved by five hours before you to take seven hours. And you, you're doing it on MDB kind of capacity? Are you, are you upping your, is your network the bottleneck or is it the I think it's positive. Like uh, we are already using at some point like 80 or 90% CPU. Of the Postgres instance. It would be this guy or Bond, my guess is. You think it's the drops? Yeah. So, how much data is all? Sorry? How much data is mm. you utilize as well? Do you remember the actual number of data? How much data? Yeah, how much data is the addresses? Uh, the actual addresses is. It's like close to a terabyte, maybe like 700 gigabytes yeah. a terabyte. But we didn't do any performance tuning, essentially. Yeah. This is more like, uh, we're moving from ETL Postgres to Spark. And one of the things we want to utilize Kubernetes and upscaling is by essentially from this project. And our data models are fairly small for different kinds of companies. So you're moving to migrate from Dataproc to Spark? No, not Dataproc. From, we did use to do EEG chunking. Like, essentially, we didn't use any big data technology before. And we decided to migrate to Spark from Postgres ETL, essentially. Doing on Postgres, plus doing some processing in several IT chunks. And also, we did some ETL on BigQuery too. Uh, and right now, essentially, we're moving from SQL to Spark. Uh, our data was not huge. It's like maybe the Zipix data source may be like two terabytes or so. Just one more question, and then I think we'll go to the wrap on It's way open. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, how you compare this to the future Airflow with Kubernetes implementation? Uh, how is it different? And, uh, so actually, we we were actually monitoring how the process, the progress of Spark and Kubernetes was going. We're probably going to end up using it afterwards. So the nice thing of the problem with our current architecture is we still have the work in between. So like the workers yeah. create a new Spark uh, uh, cluster and stuff like that. In there, we can actually cut the middleman and we can have a Kubernetes directly creating our Spark cluster. So we actually were inspired by them and by Bloomberg. So ideally, one that that technology is uh, prod ready, we can migrate to it. Okay. Well, it's basically the same idea. You run this, your image yeah. in that spark cluster. All right. Uh, thank you very much.